Okay, well, there is my cue to go ahead and get started with today's session. Welcome everybody to our um, IDRP, IDRPP Time to Act um, substance, substance Abuse Echo. Um, and if you've not taken a minute, put your name and contact information into the chat. We do record all these sessions, as you just noticed with that warning. Um, and we store those on our Canvas page. We use the echo recordings for educational and quality improvement. So hopefully you're all okay with being recorded. Um, if you've never been to an echo, welcome to your first echo. They are a great way to just build connections with everybody else who's on the call with us. And that's why we ask you if you're willing to turn on your camera, to put your name and contact information into chat. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put those in chat throughout it. Uh, we will have our hub members who all have an asterisk in front of their name, or right now we'll have an asterisk in front of their name since I reminded them. Um, but they're, they're a great way to, you know, just be able to have those conversations with everybody. Um, case narratives or case discussions or whatever you want to call them, presenting a case, a case that you want to celebrate, they are also a great way to get support on some of those difficult cases or like it letting us know some of the things that have gone really well with some of the um, clients and families that we all work with. So if you would consider doing a case, you can reach out to Project Scope at usu.edu and we will get you set up with that. Um, we do talk about some sensitive topics and some of the conversations that we have going on. Um, so just remember to protect individual privacy, de-identify any information um, and reach out to a hub member if you're unsure. Key components of an echo session are always, we always have a didactic speaker and then we do a case presentation. And then you guys all share some amazing recommendations uh, um, on the case. So it becomes a great way to just build that professional networking. We do store all of the recommendations on our Canvas page. So if you had ever wanted to go back and look at all the recommendations, because sometimes we don't have time to talk about those on the call. You can always go back and look at what other people are saying with that. Um, take a minute to rename your pro profile. Let us know where you're from so other people can know who to reach out to if you've shared something that is really interesting. I may want to know more information. Um, I see Kelly Trump on my screen. And so if she had shared something, I know who and where to reach out to her um, to follow up on some of those questions. We always encourage you to pre-register um, in advance for the sessions uh, so that you can get our weekly announcements. We will be dropping in a survey as well as the PowerPoint throughout today's session. So that's how we give out credit for attendance. We will, after you complete the survey in a month, we will send you um, the certificate of attending today's session. Canvas is again where we store those all of our resources, any information. So if you do not have access to Canvas, please email us at projectscope at usu.edu and put Echo Canvas um, in the subject line and we'll get you connected on that. Again, just another plug for those case studies. I know sometimes talking in front of people, even when we're on Zoom can be nerve wracking, they do not have to match the topic. So the case that we're presenting today is not about um, naloxone, but it is really about just a family who's struggling with some of these issues that go along with substance abuse. So please remember um, any case that you wanna share, celebrate, talk about, um, consider sending in a case study. We do have social media where we try to share information and resources that people send us about what's going on 
um, on our different echoes that we have here at the Institute. So if you wanna take a minute and scan those QR codes and um, follow us on social media, that would be fantastic. I am going to um, stop sharing and just welcome in our didactic presenter today. Um, Tim, he is just a wealth of information and I'm really excited to have him share with us today. Yeah, well, hey, thank you guys very much for um, inviting me to present today and talk about um, some of the things that, that we do and that I do as well as some of the people I know that are on the line that they do also. So um, Ms. Bishop from the Department of Health and different groups from the Department of Health, um, as well as some other docs and different people that are here, um, providers as well as students. So it's exciting to have you here and hopefully uh, we can provide some good information um, and welcome questions or things you might like to add um, as we go through this process. So as this is, we're gonna talk a little about naloxone um, and some substance use prevention programming that we do. Um, like they said, I'm, I'm with part of what we call um, the Hearts Initiative, which is an initiative began about five years ago that um, includes some of these people. And it's actually turned into an initiative now from a team. We had five people that started about five years ago. Um, and that's changed now to include probably 20 people now from across our university in different groups to help us with what we call the Heart Initiative um, to help reduce substance misuse across the state of Utah. You'll see some of the people we have here. Some of you are familiar with some of these guys. Um, it's a great group of people that I have here with me. Um, some faculty locations where we first began. Now we're completely across the state um, with all different providers from Extension. Um, so we're excited to see this continuing to grow. Um, we talk about purposes of training. You know, we're going to talk about substance use disorders, um, talk about harm reduction. We want you to understand a little bit about overdose, um, about some of the signs and symptoms that happen, um, how to, to respond. Um, this is about 15 minutes of training, but we'll see how long it really goes, depending on what we want to look at. Um, we're going to talk about some of the things that I'd like you to, to learn about. Um, overview of opioids and fentanyl, specifically, and I'm talking about identifying substance use signs of responding to an opioid overdose, um, legal considerations a little bit, just briefly, um, and touch a little bit on self-care and treatment resources. Um, and hopefully I have time for some questions um, along the way. Okay, I appreciate being, again, time to act echo, substance abuse, life uh, across the lifespan. It's a pretty exciting way to have a program um, start. So I'm glad to be here and do this. Talk a little bit, they mentioned this a little bit, Janelle did, um, about understanding this is a difficult subject to talk about sometimes. And some of the stuff we see, uh, many of you are the providers and people that are um, doing some of this work will see things that are sometimes difficult for us, um, as well as the people we work with. So just being aware that some of the stuff we will talk about will be a little bit difficult. Um, we do talk about being able to, you know, call, 911 is all we ask of you to do. All we ask of you to do is get some help for the people that we're working with. Um, we do have 988 numbes. Um, I put some of the findtreatment.gov information on here uh, for people that may ask for that. Remember your importance. Um, do what you can um, and then ask for help if you can't do more, um, especially for yourself. Um, overview a little bit, just kind of get some numbers and things. Um, we talk about the amount of opioids sold in the U.S. is quadruple, it's probably more than that now. This is an older slide that we have. Um, we talk about all of the requests for pain meds increased significantly, but the amount of pain re reported by Americans has not really changed that much. So if you think of the numbers, um, huge numbers out there when we talk about pain um, and what really does happen to people. And we talk about, you know, there being enough pain pills for um, populations to have one pill per person in the U.S. Um, as we've gotten to this point now. Um, for the overview, overview, again, we talk about prescription take backs, talk about disposing of medications properly. Um, as soon as your treatment is done, there are drop boxes and things across the state of Utah. 
and across the, the nation um, in most cases. Um, there's always a place to take things back if you need to. Um, that's what we ask people to do. Um, if you don't have a good way to dispose of it, um, here's some information here you can take and you can go to take back day and you get information about who's doing things on the 27th. That's a big day across um, the state of Utah, basically across the nation, right? To get some of these drugs off of the street. Um, and having been involved in this for uh, many years, we see a lot of strange things come back. Um, and I've been involved with days where we've done this and even a small community where we had someone drop off liters of liquid morphine that was being used by a family that obviously had someone who was um, in kind of a hospice treatment at home. And the person who dropped it off, we kind of looked at the person and they told us what it was for, what, what had happened with his family. Um, and so we you know, said, so we're sorry that that occurred and you experienced that. But after the person left, um, I looked at the police officer that was with me from one of our coalitions and he just shook his head and go, I've never seen this before. Um, and so we learned that you know things happen that we may not expect. And because with take back days, we have to have law enforcement there. Um, I, I was pretty happy to have him take that and put that away and lock it in his car until he could get back to his office uh, to have that um, picked up and taken back to be disposed of. Because you don't want to have four or five huge liters of liquid morphine hanging around a table um, as we're doing some collection. So again, I've learned new things. So take back is important. The DEA group is great. Um, the National Guard is great that we work with here um, in Utah. So there's lots of people to get help from if you need it. Okay, some risk factors for overdose. Um, I'm sure many of you know these, um, but, but what can happen to anyone? Um, some factors may make people more likely, though, to overdose. And we talk about mental health disorders um, with co occurring substance use disorders, right? SUDs is what we talk a lot about, but taking other medications, antidepressants, Prozac, benzos, uh, muscle relaxants, all those can have greater um, impacts. Uh, and someone who takes an opioid. We'll talk about opioids in a second about what they really are. Um, if you drink alcohol, obviously that can cause more problems for someone, um, especially if there's a history of um, alcoholism in that person or even in the family. Um, taking opioids after taking a break from them, it's a nice way to say after they maybe have been incarcerated or um, not taking them for a while for other reasons. Uh, recent surgeries, you know, high doses, prolonged durations, um, and being elderly, having a user error, uh, being an EMS, we were involved in situations where we'd respond to emergencies. Um, and it basically, it was just someone giving medication to their family member, not realizing that someone else had already given medication. Um, and then, you know, being surprised with what had occurred and thinking maybe it was a cardiac event and it really was not that event. So being aware of that became important for us. Um, why are we concerned? I just took a number that I had um, used in one of our presentations a number of years ago, just to show you kind of how that changed. Um, and from August 21 to 22, there are approximately 107,735 um, reported overdoses and deaths um, in the US. Uh, that number obviously has increased to over 110,000 people. And somewhere between 70 and 80%, depending on how it's measured, um, are, because of um, opioids, uh, so a synthetic or uh, natural occurring opioids. So a lot of people have died um, from that. We talk about being possibly from some cartels in Mexico. I'm sorry, 66% were the opioids uh, that were synthetics like fentanyls. Um, so we talk about China, all that, where there may be traffic, traffic to our communities across the United States and even in Utah, I mean, it's fascinating to talk with anybody, anybody from the DEA on the line. Hopefully, it's okay for me to say this, but um, the DEA knows exactly where the drugs come from. They can monitor and measure where it comes from. They know it's not a question as to what happens and how it gets here. It doesn't matter what do we do now um, with Utah, especially um, with I-15 and different major highways where people are driving through and um, every few days here, once a week or so, we have someone who gets stopped and they find, you know, thousands of fentanyl pills or hundreds of pounds of something um, in their cars. 
Um, and it's not unusual. So the question for a lot of people um, in Utah, at least, and people I work with is, if we're catching those numbers, what's really going on with those other cars going by or the big trucks going by, or what's the real number of drugs that are coming into the U.S. just through Utah? So huge numbers, and we have lots of problems in southern Utah, Emory counties, and some of those counties where we have done a lot of work um, with lots of coalitions, lots of great people from our team that um, have made some differences in those communities. But um, it's really hard to stop drugs when people know it's coming, but uh, can't stop it. And having people stop off and drop it in our communities is not something we want to see. So great people working on it, but it's difficult. Um, lots of concern for how we can make this be something different. Okay, basic stuff, you know, what are opioids? Um, it's depressant, blocks pain receptors, um, reduce consciousness, um, can decrease or stop breathing if it's taken um, too much uh, or too many. Um, the stronger an opioid, more likely is it cause an overdose. So we have some things just showing oxys, hydrocodone, uh, hydromorphine, acetaminophen, all those things on here. Uh, tramadol is a drug, which is really fascinating to me. Um, I injured my back years ago and was told tramadol was a non-narcotic. And was I was given that, one of the first people to take it um, 25 years ago, over 25 years ago, I took it um, and was part of um, some groups that were just wanting to see what it was like. I had lots of questionnaires I filled out when I first taken it. And I remember I kept being told it was not a narcotic and was non-addictive. So again, it wasn't true. Um, and in some cases, the tramadol has been really difficult for people to um, get off of and change because of the effect on the body. Um, and I know that from having seen what happens personally. So again, we have these, I and mean, then we have um, the illicit kind of medications. Um, there were opioids, the heroines and things that are being used. Um, and then the things that are being manufactured, uh, which is fentanyl, carfentanil, um, and all of those medications, or I should say synthetic opioids that are being used by people um, illicitly. Here are some of the effects of the opiates um, on the body. See this again, euphoria is what people are obviously aiming for with opioids. Some people may not have an um, euphoric effect, it just depends on personalities and um, physiology of someone. But the big thing we look at with overdoses and what we are concerned with is that decreasing um, or stop breathing um, with an overdose, um, intentional or unintentional. And anybody who works um, in this field and does work, there's things that happen that some people are um, trying to do and some people are not trying to do. Um, and working with suicide prevention also, um, to me, um, an overdose um, and suicide um, are pretty similar um, because there's a lack of hope in many people. And also many people that um, are revived um, sometimes ask, why was I revived? Um, what, what do I have going forward? Um, and trying to get them into treatment right away and get them some help really makes some um, great differences. And I've seen that be effective for a lot of people um, in our treatment groups. So getting them in as soon as we can after an overdose um, is really important um, as an aside for what I do. Okay, identifying substance use at work, school, or home. Um, we talk about how do we know if someone's using things? Um, could they have used a substance? Um, how do we get in? So there's some, some ideas of how to do that. Um, because people will often ask us, what do we do when we see a substance that's being used or think there may be something going on, um, especially with overdose. So we'll see if it if anyone's there, um, especially if you're in a home somewhere, uh, knock on the door and try and get in the street if you can. Um, and then we talk about a possible opioid overdose. Okay, one of the things that I just want to say really quickly also, um, what's naloxone or Narcan? Um, we'll talk about that in a second, but it's important to understand that there's no difference between an opioid from a prescription medication or an opioid from heroin or another illicit substance. Um, it's the same, the body is, it doesn't know, this may react a, a little differently based on um, essentially the type of medication that's being done or illicit drug that's being provided, but the body doesn't really care. The body's just gonna respond as the body would respond to um, the medication in, in any form. 
So signs of an opioid overdose, right? Small pinpoint pupils, the faint heartbeat, um, down to possibly one per minute. Um, blue, blue, purple fingernails, non-responsive, can't be woken up. Shallow or slow breathing, uh, gurgling or choking noise towards the end. So lots of things that we can look for when we're looking at signs of an opioid overdose. Um, I put some things in here about alcohol poisoning and then some cocaine overdoses, just kind of for your reference at some point to look at. Um, if you're um, wondering how this, um, having an opioid in their system affects what happens with someone who may be um, using alcohol. So um, the difference just becomes in the ability to breathe, right? The respiratory rate is depressed um, significantly with opioids. Um, it, it may be in, in some of the alcohol poisoning, but again, there's opportunities to look at a medication um, and an overdose to see what's happening to that patient or that person. And the best thing to know, if you don't know what's happening with that person um, and you suspect that there may be an opioid in their system, is providing naloxone or Narcan to that person. Um, we see there are some differences, obviously, in opioid overdoses versus alcohol poisoning and cocaine. But if you have opioids and you, you know, mix them with alcohol and cocaine or meth gets mixed with um, opioids a lot also here, synthetic especially, synthetic opioids and methamphetamines go hand in hand here uh, in Northern Utah, um, being aware of that and just being able to give them some naloxone um, can save their lives. Um, so we're going to talk just kind of quickly about some of the fentanyl because it's something else we get asked a lot about. Um, we talk about that being something a synthetic opioid, 50 times more potent than heroin, and the liquid or powder. Um, we feel, find mostly in powder here, hard to smell or taste. Um, tolerance is different for everybody. It's actually put into our street drugs here. We're finding it significantly um, across the board and across the United States. Um, just talk about, put some just DEA numbers in here, um, just so people could see, you know, they seized more than 79.5 million fentanyl-laced pills in 2023 and 12,000 pounds of powder. So we're talking about being equivalent to making enough lethal doses to kill 376 million people, right? So huge numbers of people that could be killed by lethal doses if we had that um, done across the board um, in our population. Um, seven out of 10 pills contain potentially deadly dose of fentanyl. I've watched that change from, I think it started from DEA first, it was like four out of 10 pills. I think it was three years ago when I first began working here, three or four years ago, I think it was um, four pills out of 10 contained fentanyl. Now we're up to seven out of 10 pills and probably higher um, in some locations, especially they have deadly dose of fentanyl. Um, and in 2024, when I just pulled this off um, probably a week ago or so, fentanyl seizures represented 93.7 million deadly doses. In 2024, that's so far, with two milligrams of fentanyl equaling a deadly dose. So huge numbers of fentanyl being dropped off into our, our communities across the state. So what fentanyl looks like, kind of put the things, I know we, we sent this, or we're going to send this out to people if they like this information. So really just information for people to look at, see what it looks like. Um, and the thing that I find really interesting is that some of the pills that they make um, with fentanyl um, look more professional than some of the medication that's actually provided um, by our pharmaceutical companies. So it's really fascinating that that's, they've gotten that good at it. And I'll show you why um, with the pill press, the pill press example right here. Um, so it's just some examples, some of the DEA um, pill presses that they've actually taken um, and tried to you know dispose of some of them. And I'm sure they repurpose some, use some for demonstration, but you know, it's just amazing to me that we have this much going on in our community on a regular basis coming through, you know, so in 2024, 
um, 21 um, pill presses that were captured and taken in. And then this one pill press um, was found with over 80,000 fake fentanyl pills designed to look like Xanax, Oxy, Oxy or MDMA. Um, and that's really scary because this is what's getting delivered um, to our doors by a, a service almost like DoorDash. People ordering things online or on their phone and having it delivered. Um, and people don't know what it is. They think it's something else. Um, and they take it um, and then they die um, of an overdose. So pretty scary things going on. And especially with some of our youth, um, the, the, some numbers show that there's less people actually using drugs especially illicit drugs, but uh, more people are dying of them because we're finding them um, being more deadly for our population. Okay, so getting to naloxone and Narcan, finally after that, right? So all those exciting things going on. Um, it's an overdose um, reversal medication. Only works for an opioid overdose, but it will not harm um, if you don't have opioids in your system, or as we would say, on board. Um, Generally, no side effects for 99.9% .9 of the population, but it will cause an acute opioid withdrawal. So you have to be aware of that too. That's going to happen. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about an acute opioid withdrawal in a second. But the effects of Narcan, naloxone. You now, Narcan is the actual nasal spray that we actually use. It's a brand name. Um, um, naloxone is obviously a generic name for um, what we're doing to try and reduce overdoses. Um, you may need to give more than one dose. So people, that's why there's actually two in nasal kits that we have, the nasal sprays. Um, I've ever worked in a hospital where we gave um, naloxone IV um, and just kept, we had a patient that was having some issues and we just kept giving them naloxone. And we, and they, we had difficulty reviving that patient. So we provided care to support that person um, and waited to see what we could do with some of the tox screens. Um, see so when they came back, what we could do to help that person. Because we had given um, so much naloxone, we stopped and asked the doctors if we could continue to give it to that patient. So again, you see lots of things that go on like that now. Um, people using multiple substances, so we don't know. So we talk about giving um, Narcan during an overdose, if that might be something we think it is. Um, now it's available over the counter, which is pretty amazing. Um, it's about 40, we see it for about 45 to $49 here um, in Northern Utah, but maybe have some different prices other places. But it's a great thing to have. We try to encourage people to have it on their body or somewhere on their backpacks or purses, whatever, um, all the time. Um, if I could have my way, it'd be we'd learn CPR um, and do this right along with it, how to use naloxone or Narcan. So being available in pharmacies, being available um, through agencies like us or the health department um, or other agencies is a great way to get it if you need it um, um, or directing people that may need it to that um, so they can get it actually for low or no cost um, through some of our government agencies, which is great. And our health department here, the Department of Health in Utah has been actually really supportive of what we do for many years. They're a great group to work with. Um, you know, some great opportunities to use this and give it to people that need it. Um, I think that's been really important. We've saved a lot of lives with Narcan in Utah. You can go online and see some of the things uh, from some of the groups that do that. Um, and I think it's pretty amazing that we have that opportunity to save a life and keep that person alive um, so they can get treatment um, and become the productive member of society that they, we hope they will be. This is what we use. Ours is Narcan. It's what it looks like. Um, talking about how Narcan naloxone works. Okay. So we have opioids, which are that orange little semicircle um, that attaches to opioid receptors in the brain, um, can cause breathing to slow down or possibly stop um, if there's too much um, of an opioid in the system. So that's what happens when someone is undergoing an overdose. What naloxone does is naloxone actually knocks that receptor um, and puts Narcan on that opioid receptor. So 
But Narcan is stronger affinity to opioid receptors. So it kicks the opioids off receptors for 30, 90 minutes. So it allows a person to begin to breathe again. So kind of cool that the way that works. Um, but remembering that, you know, these kind of orange, well, these yellow rectangles versus the orange circles um, will only stay on there as long as the affinity is greater. So when it's naloxone, um, the affinity for naloxone is less, and those, the opioids, again, take over that receptor, people go back into that overdose phase again. So being aware that once you've given naloxone, that person is revived, you may have to continue to do that later. Uh, so we need to monitor that person somehow by getting them uh, 911, calling 911, or getting them additional care um, in a hospital or treatment center. Oops, okay, it took a little bit of time. So we've got some, I don't know if it's going to work when um, we send this out to all of you, but there are just some um, pretty good videos available that we included in this. We're not going to play them because we've just talked about that, but there's some things that talk about how things work um, if people are interested in that. So when we talk about simple steps to responding to an opioid overdose. One of the things we talk about um, is putting the person down, just like you do with CPR, check for responsiveness. Um, if you have a nasal spray, we talk about using that quickly, just putting up that person's nose and spraying it, um, calling 911, stay with the individual, um, chest compressions if necessary. Um, you can do rescue breathing, which is one breath every five seconds, or chest compressions at 100, 200 compressions, or sorry, 100 to 120 compressions uh, per minute. We always talk with the staying alive thing, right? EMS, we did that even. thought that was kind of fun, but um, doing that was important if you need to. Um, and then if there's no response, within three minutes, say two to three minutes, having someone measure that for us um, is pretty important. Give me a second dose of naloxone um, if necessary. And if you have to leave, or if you just want to monitor that person for a bit, putting recovery positions, important. What we tell people to do, put people on their side and continue to do sternal rubs. So rubbing on the sternum really hard with your knuckles, um, talking to them, rubbing their back. We don't want to give them anything to eat or inject anything into them or throw them in a shower or anything like that. This is what people used to do in, um, years ago. Um, but we want them just to, to know somebody's there with them. So keep talking to that person and hopefully waking them up um, to someone they know. What we find, because people are going to acute opioid withdrawal, they can be really sick. They can have a, you know, be very unhappy when they wake up. So what we want you to do is to have someone around them that they know, so family member, loved one, whatever, talking to them as you're trying to get them to be revived or woken up. Um, that way it alleviates a lot of other issues with someone maybe um, wondering what's happening. I know that you know with some of the patients we work with, you know, someone wakes up and sees a bunch of people look like police officers or an EMS with, you know, all of our clothing on with all of our junk with us. And people don't like that sometimes. And so we have to be aware that we have to make sure people are more comfortable with what's happening. So having family members, loved ones, or someone they know around, if possible, can be helpful um, in trying to keep that person from um, leaving or um, walking out the door or saying, hey, I'm done, I'm okay. We want that person to be around so we can check and make sure that they aren't having another adverse effect or go back into opioid overdose. Okay, will I get in trouble if I call for help? The Good Samaritan laws, we talk about some of these. Um, the Good Samaritan law protects people who call 911. There's immunity uh, from arrest for drug possession. Um, but what I get asked a lot of times is, hey, Tim, you know, it was great. We saved the life or whatever, but the police officers, um, talked to me and, and found out that I had an outstanding warrant or something else. It's like, well, you did your job. Thanks for saving that life. Um, but, you know, you're going to be arrested if you have something outstanding. And they understood that They're pretty good about that. But some of the questions that I get asked by, hey, Tim, it doesn't really work that way. I was arrested. And we found out by talking to them a little bit further that that's not really what happened. I've also had situations where we've had police officers who have actually um, coming to the scene of someone who's been revived, um, along with EMS, whoever it might be, um, and that person is just thanked 
uh, by the police officers and by the agencies responding, and that person just walks away. So again, every community is going to be different. Um, a lot of police officers may be different as well as their uh, protocols, but saving a life is pretty important. And so people that I work with in treatment, once they've saved a life, it, we actually talk about saving two lives, we talk about saving the person that was revived, and oftentimes a person who revives them, who oftentimes thinks that they are now worthy, uh, sometimes of even life. Um, and by doing something like this, where they carry naloxone and are able to help someone, um, it can actually turn a lot of lives around. And I've seen that myself. That's something I'm very grateful for when we have naloxone or do this kind of training. Okay, the other treatments that we do um, for opioid use disorder, what are we going to do with that kind of thing? There's medications, suboxone, methadone, other things. Also, I took some of them off, but um, there's other medications that can be used when people um, are in treatment. We talk about having using medications um, along with counseling and therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy and other kind of therapy also can be helpful. Um, we talk about making sure we use trauma-informed care, um, those core principles of safety, trust and transparency, peer support, collaboration, empowerment, humility, and responsiveness are very important to all of us. Um, and all the government agencies we work with uh, follow those things um, or try to the best they can. So being able to find treatment, findtreatment.gov is a great way to get information about what's close to us. It'll give you right down to uh, the street where they are. So it's a great thing as a map even. Uh, 211 to get services just for people with mental health issues. You now, the substance use disorder falls under a mental health um, diagnosis. That's been very helpful for a lot of people to get support that they need. And then USARA, there's a lot of really good support services uh, for people recovering from substance use and misuse. Okay, so to me, uh, this is a great way to know that there's treatment available for people to get help. Um, and that's something that we can find by just looking online um, or asking our providers, uh, our medical providers, what's available. We we'll talked just for a second about um, some of the harm reduction stuff that we do also. We talk about saving lives with naloxone and Narcan. It's very important. Being able to have that capacity is something that's pretty amazing for a lot of people. Um, even for myself, be able to save lives. Um, as an EMS provider, and then even as a um, person who's just, you know, walking the street, it's pretty amazing. So being aware that you can do that is important. So requesting naloxone or Narcan um, would be great. There's also other groups that provide that. Uh, Utah Naloxone is a great group. I used to have it on my other slides, but I don't think I have it on this one. But Utah Naloxone is a great person to talk to, or a great, I should say, a great group to talk with if you'd like to, um, as well as go online for just Utah naloxone to have um, injectable naloxone sent to you. It's something you'd like. Um, we talk about harm reduction. Um, harm reduction really means that we appreciate the people who are misusing a drug. We don't um, talk negative to them. We try and improve their lives in some way. So we see some examples of harm reduction, wearing sunscreen, seatbelts, speed limits, birth control, cigarette filters, all those are important also. But for us, you know, the injectables are important too. So having some of those available um, is important as well as nasal spray. Um, we got some stuff never use alone. There's actually never use alone is a um, number. It's got a phone number also on this that you can call. If you click on that, you get a phone number and people can call. If they're going to use a drug by themselves, they actually have somebody who will stay on the line with them while they're using that drug to make sure that they're responsive um, and not going to die of an overdose from that drug. That's pretty amazing that they do that. They'll stay in line for 20 to 30 minutes or longer if necessary, if someone is using a drug. That's pretty crazy to me. It's pretty amazing that there's groups of people that will do that. Um, but some of the people that we talk to in treatment have, have found that that's something that they, they would use or have used um, to keep themselves alive. So. It's pretty cool that they do that, but they also encourage people to get treatment. So when we talk about harm reduction, it's not just trying to make sure that people can use drugs safely um, in their own way. It's always advocating for them to get further care 
and further treatment um, and direct them towards treatment, which I think is uh, pretty important, obviously. So there's some, some emails or emails, some online web pages you can look up if you'd like. <clears throat> we talk about, again, harm reduction. We have fentanyl test strips that we have out there that people can use to see if there's fentanyl in the drugs they're using. Um, there's actually a whole kind of series of things they do to prepare the drug they want to test and then dip it in, see if it has um, any of these properties, if it's negative, positive, or, or invalid. And that's really kind of amazing that we can do that with our communities. We've actually done it um, for our communities um, in Northern Utah to provide them that opportunity to get this tested um, and make sure we don't have people dying of overdoses. So pretty amazing that we can do that. Yeah, it's kind of because we've talked about saving lives with naloxone um, and Narcan, um, talking about the practical things, the things that we see here, even in what I do, right? So what I see, um, these are all things that I've seen with what I do or have people asking me um, about a drug that they may have um, or someone is um, requesting drugs from a drug dealer. What we're finding is carfentanil is increasing again in our area. Um, so we're around 10,000 times more potent than morphine um, and even more potent than fentanyl. So it's pretty amazing that we have that drug out there um, and we're seeing it. And so we want people to be really careful and know that that's something that's available on the street um, and it can cause um, death pretty quickly and overdose if someone's not aware that's what they're taking. So we're seeing that. Um, <clears throat> this was supposed to have been the first slide, but I did it out of order one of them. So just real quickly, in treatment, we see all these things, right? We see all these things that are happening. Um, people who've had their children taken away. We talk about people who actually are using, for the first time in my career, had people using fentanyl as your drug of choice. Not something I ever expected, but something that we're seeing on a regular basis now. Um, I've had people who actually were the drug dealers of fentanyl. Uh, and asked them how did they, they did that. And they said, well, if somebody wants to buy it from me, I'm not responsible for their death. So it's kind of an eye-opening situation to work with all of these different populations to try and get them the help that they need uh, in treatment. So DWI arrests, drug court, all those things that are happening up here. Um, the jails that we work with, uh, multiple health issues, related incarceration, drug use for integration into society. Um, I work with the homeless population um, up here in Logan. Um, and so many things happen with that population. Um, it's really difficult for them to sometimes get back into society. They don't feel like they're valued. They don't feel like they're wanted in many ways. So their drug use actually increases at times as their homelessness uh, becomes more acute. Um, we talk about people staying at the warming center um, that I worked with um, and the VA. Talking about people in the canyons living there um, with many uh, mental health and substance use disorders across all those populations. First responders, um, law enforcement, EMS, um, fire, suffering from acute substance use disorders and mental health issues. Treatment difficult because of the stigma and culture of agencies. Um, and the military, active duty members, with significant PTSD, substance use disorders, and mental health concerns. These are the just the groups that I work with, right? This is the people that I've actually worked with in the last, let's say, six months. These are just a, an example of people that I work with um, when I talk about substance use. So we know we see some things that are pretty um, concerning um, and why we find that naloxone and Narcan is important, as well as having good treatment facilities and working with our departments um, across the way. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so xylazine, we see some of that too. People had that up here for the first time in a while. That came back. Um, it's increased significantly. Just more information that talks a little bit about that. Some that we've had people talk to us about here in Northern Utah. Um, contaminated street drugs, again, it's just examples of kind of the authentic and fake oxys, Adderalls um, that we know are there. 
So you can go to DEA fact sheets and look up all this information to get more information. And so what we're seeing on the street um, is this type of thing up here um, in Logan with the pills um, containing fentanyl. All right, so we kind of switch our gears a little bit. We talked about some of those difficult things that we're seeing um, that I see on a regular basis and other providers see across the way um, and across our state um, and across the country. Um, we need to be careful. We're talking about these things about self-care. We need to have people take care of themselves also. Make sure when they respond to an emergency, they have someone to talk to um, afterwards. Making sure they can reach out and get help if they need it. Um, I didn't put on here, but there's employee assistance programs where people are supposed to be able to call and get help. I have a lot of people that will come and see us um, that will not go and use those programs because they're afraid they might lose their jobs. Um, and that's really disappointing because it is a separate company in most cases um, and they will not lose their jobs. But I've had people come to me in the military afraid they're going to lose their military uh, positions um, if they admit to having substance use disorders or mental health concerns. So we know these things can happen. So we want everyone to take care of themselves. They're also providing care as well as the people are working with and have some information for them um, to look at. Okay, real quickly, recognize the symptoms of stress in yourself and others. Uh, when you're feeling irritated or angry, or denial, uncertain, nervous or anxious, feeling helpless, powerless, lack of motivation, you're tired, overwhelmed, burnt out, sad or depressed, having trouble sleeping, having trouble concentrating. If you recognize these in yourself or someone else or your colleagues, talk to them about it. See what you can do to help that person. We have the 988 suicide and crisis line on. It's a great thing to call if you have questions or concerns. There's providers that talk with you about that. It's not just for suicide. They do want to talk to people that are in crisis or have concerns about their mental health. So a great group to talk with. Um, and then we talk about some of these things. You recognize some symptoms of stress occurring. Take some of those things below that that we talked about. Commit to taking 10 to 15 minutes to do some things for yourself. With some of these examples, you know, go outside, go for a walk. One of the best things you can do clinically that we worked with people is to going for a walk, taking that walk, reducing your stress, doing some of that, uh, moving your body. So being active, relax, meditate. Um, make sure you're doing self-care that works for you. Check in with somebody. Have someone check in with you. Um, have a partner or someone that you can confide in to talk to. Work on your faith. Do something, something important to you. Connect to that. Practice gratitude, thankfulness. Laugh, a great way to, to reduce your stress. Be social, right? Go with other people. Um, get a hobby. Get professional help. I don't really have a hobby, but you know, this is what I like to do. Just things I like to do are these kind of things. So some simple things you can do to help yourself um, as well as others. And if that doesn't work, there's things that become overwhelming. You have things that you can't stop thoughts or something or mental health concerns uh, for yourself or others professionals are available um, it's sometimes it's difficult in rural areas but people are there to help if you look for it online you can actually work with people online for therapy if you need to um, as something has changed in the last five years that um, i wouldn't expect but it can be beneficial to a lot of people if you need that so and if there's actually people i know that you can contact um, if you have questions or concerns. So it's a great way to do that. Self-care is important. Remember, you are important. Okay. Talk about, again, calling 911 is enough. It's all you need to do. We've got some of the lines here again for United Way, providers, all of us here uh, for people that might need that. <clears throat> Other information, I put some of these things on here just to, so people could see um, from the National Safety Council 1.7 million non-fatal poisonings occurred in the U.S. in 2021. Think about that. 1.7 million non-fatal poisonings. At the same time, we're talking about over 100,000 people died. So again, significant amount of people um, having problems with opioids. So being aware of that, I think, becomes um, important for all of us. All right, news from the DEA. Again, fentanyl. If it's purchased outside a licensed pharmacy, are illegal, dead, deadly, and dangerous. 
And then common emoji code, which is kind of amazing. Emojis used, used to order drugs for delivery to homes, dorms, workplaces, and more. I didn't put this on this presentation, but there's a whole series of things you can look up and go, oh my gosh, this is what my kid's doing. This is what my family's doing. This is what my loved one's doing. There's emojis for certain things that they can get online and just order that. So pretty amazing. And it's really strange. The, the Canadian maple leaf, if you see that as an emoji, that's the emoji for drugs. So for all different kinds of drugs. So look up that if you have a chance. It's a great way to look and see what's going on um, in our communities. And then DEA, again, talking about seizures, what they've done. Um, never use alone, again, connecting people um, online so they can get the help that they might need. And we're talking about overview. Hope we did, we've done some things with um, the five things that we want people to know. Overviews, identifying some substance use stuff, signs of responding to opioid overdoses, legal considerations. Just real briefly, some things on that, and then self-care. All right, we're up to questions. What questions might people have? I think we're, we've got a couple of minutes, maybe. I'll stop sharing, I think, for a moment. You're off. First, this is my information. Um, again, we, you'll be able to get this um, through Janelle and her group online. Well, let me stop sharing for a moment and see if there is any questions. Right, kind of quickly. Brief overview I gave you on some of the substance use disorders and naloxone Narcan use. Yeah, Tim, I was wondering, this is Janelle. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to, I know one time you were saying that you go in and train young uh, children how to use naloxone. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you're finding there? Because that was shocking to me. Yes, we we um, were asked to go and work with groups um, in San Juan County, and we brought in. We're we're bringing. I worked with Indian Health Services, and we brought in people from kind of the Four Corners area and across the state. And people came in, and, and we had youth, and we didn't know whether we should be talking about naloxone or Narcan with those groups. Um, it was actually um, preschool to fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade. I mean, what we worked with, and so. Those groups came in and we had young children that we were talking with about, you know, we had pictures of pills on, on a big board and what was real, what wasn't real and asking the students what they thought of them. And, you know, we had some really young students who thought, well, they're not going to really talk much about it. But we had young students, um, so four years old, talking about how their mom puts her drugs away when the boyfriend comes or when company comes to their house and we were like putting drugs away she said yeah whatever she goes yeah we yeah my mom puts you know her special stuff away and we were like okay that's interesting um and we didn't want to go too far with that obviously just in a big group of students but we said okay the teacher was going to talk a little further about some of those things but that same day we had um fifth graders that were telling us how to use naloxone and narcan before we trained them they already knew. They'd worked with the, they'd seen the fire department come in multiple times to their home. They talked about how uh, people's stomachs were pumped. They knew how it already worked. They were talking about a group. We had 600 students that came through that day. And, and most of them, like I said, from preschool, so four years old to uh, fifth, sixth grade, had seen someone either overdose someone be responded to by someone um, in fire, EMS, or law enforcement. Um, and it was just normal. It wasn't anything that surprised them. And so from, from that point, we looked at, okay, this is not something that we're going to stop doing. And, and we've worked with people. And I'll have, if I do this in a community setting, I will have parents bring their whole families will come in to be trained, especially someone who's gone through treatment or has had a, a loved one go through treatment. They'll bring their children in. And we'll train young children to do this. And we don't want to go too young, but um, I'd say probably the youngest we've had was I think first or second grade that we've actually trained um, to use naloxone because their parents asked us to because they had misused drugs for many years, even though they were in treatment now and we're out, we're doing really well. They still worried about that occurring. Um, and families and friends, you know, do have that happen on a regular basis. 
So it's it's just tough sometimes to work with that. But it's not unusual for me to have very young children um, say, "Yeah, I'm used to that. I've seen that. It's not unusual." So good, yeah, good, yeah, good comment. That's kind of something we don't want to see, but I would rather have them learn the right way and know where a, something like that is. Um, because what we find in most cases is we have young children know where their drugs are, right? They know where their parents' drugs are. It's just, it's just in their cabinet. They know where to get, know how to get them. That's where was a huge number of, of children get illegal medications um, from their parents. That's where they come from. It's not even a surprise. And I'll tell you really quick, one of the things I also had knew happened here um, in Northern Utah at a school, I won't name the school, but the school, people walked in, the children would walk in. So there were high school age students who would walk in every morning, a group of friends. There was a, they had a little bowl that they, every morning they walked in and they put a pill in it. Okay, no one knew what the pill was, a prescription medication. They would put a pill in it they would shake it up, then they would all take one. And that's what they did for many mornings. And I was like, that doesn't really happen. Somebody's just kind of making that up. That's not really something that goes on. And I had a colleague that goes, you know, my brother went to that school. That's exactly what happened. It's not made up. It's not something someone heard. Their brother had actually seen that happen. So can you imagine that? High school age kids doing things, obviously, adolescence, difficult anyway, but I was just really surprised that that's, you know, that's in Utah happening. It's kind of a, a rural school. It was a normal thing to happen. It wasn't a surprise to anyone. And so to me, like I said, I've learned that I don't discount anything with children. I'll talk to the children anytime or anyone that actually expresses an interest in learning more about what we do, because I see so many things that occur. And I'm sure some of my other colleagues that are even on his line have seen that also where we know things that are going to happen. Sometimes we can't stop them, um, but we can hopefully have an impact on those that are looking for help. And I've had people tell me, why are we keeping this person alive? You know, four or five responses, right? We respond to them four or five times. We revive them three or four times. What, you know, we're just going to die. Why are we doing that? Well, it's going to, I had people tell me if they're not alive, we can't get them in treatment. And that's what I really kind of took from a lot of people we worked with you know, a lot of times it's the people that actually misuse drugs that said, don't give up on us, right? Don't give up on us because you never know when that last time, that one time might work for somebody. Or like I have said to you guys right now, even if I have somebody that saves a life using naloxone, that person has just changed the trajectory of what they're going to do for their life. I'm also, all of a sudden they want to be peer educators. They want to help people. Tom will go into social work. Because they've actually had an impact on it. They saved a life, man. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing to save a life um, as someone, especially someone who's misused drugs for, you know, 5, 10, 20 years and thought that they didn't have any value. And then they saved a life. And so, yeah, so I'm always, I'm, I'm get really disappointed when someone tells me we don't deserve to save that life. Because I tell them, think about being your brother, your sister, your son. Is it important to save the life of that family member? That's what we're talking about here, doing that and having people be safe. So I'll stop now so Janelle can see what else we have to say before we go to our next opportunity. Thank you very much yeah. to all of you for being here. No, thank you. And I loved your point just right there because I think it's really critical. Like sometimes we think, as I've shared with you, being an early intervention provider, I always have you know, I get that question, why is this important? Well, it is important so that I can then educate the families that I'm working with because they may have a young teenager in their home. I don't like, I'm going to go and look at those emojis and see, because then they can help support their family, maybe not get to the point where they have an overdose. So if I'm able to share some of those resources with them. So it impacts that whole family unit. So I think knowledge is always power. So I appreciate that so much. Well, thank you. Yeah, the emoji thing was something that was really pretty fascinating because we, we talk about that with our 4-H groups. What are we doing with that? And we see it happening more and more. So, yep, be aware, everyone. Look up that information. Anybody else have any other questions before I shift focus?
Okay. Well, I appreciate your time and thank you so much. That's wonderful information. I am going to share my screen. I get to be the one who is um, presenting the case today. Um, and I'm thrilled to hear what you guys are going to um, give me as resources for it. Uh, if I can share my screen. Okay, so a little bit of background on um, this case is this is a four-year-old Mel. He does live with foster parents and a foster brother who is a year older. He has a lot of enthusiasm and really a big personality. Uh, he has been placed with his uh, this foster family when an adoptive family, they're working um, to do adoption since he was two and he's had one other um, foster placement. His mother and father both have a history of drug use, incar incarceration, and um, homelessness. There's very little information that is known to the foster family about this patient. So we're not sure if he had exposure ahead of time or in utero. Um, at three, he, uh, he had been receiving early intervention services. And then he also um, went to part B early intervention, the special ed preschool. Um, he attended the same childcare program since he was placed in this home. Um, COVID did um, impact that full-time childcare. Um, he receives occupational therapy and developmental um, interventions. The parents and the patient and his foster parent um, attend the parent-child interaction therapy on a regular basis. So some of the main concerns that are going on with this little kiddo is the um, speech and language. So he is below where he is supposed to be for his age on um, communication. He does have a lot of sensory um, seeking behaviors. He's very impulsive. He uh, moves around a lot, which then leads to a lot of that safety and compliance. Um, routines are really important for him, but bedtime routine bedtime routine is extremely difficult. It has, it takes a long time to get him to calm down in order to go to bed, um, regardless of what the strategies or the bedtime routines or hygiene that families use with it. Um, so family has those concerns around defiance. Um, it is expressed by the child care on a regular basis that he is really pretty defiant with anything. Um, the safety, um, keeping all family members safe and helping him feel safe emotionally. Um, and then they really are working to seek out an evaluation for autism and ADHD uh, with this child. So some of the goals that this family has is um, to reduce that challenging behavior at home and school? Uh, how do we obtain services to support him and his family? Um, because that early intervention and Part B preschool is ending soon because he's not hitting some of those developmental miles. I mean, he's the developmental tests are not showing that he has a area of need. And that's one of the things that always happens uh, or not always happens, but sometimes happens with these children that are um, drug exposure or have some of these areas of concern is that they don't hit those big milestones. They're not delayed in those big milestones, but they're, they have those behavior issues and regulation. So how do we help support those families? Um, and then some of the strengths is that they do have that strong attachment um, the parents are really engaged and implement those strat strategies. They are also engaged in the foster care system, and they're really eager to support all of those things. So I would love to have some discussions around what are some strategies and interventions, resources, and tools that the family can use to reduce the challenging behavior at home. How can we reduce challenging behavior at school? 
And what are the services that are available to a child and family as they transition out of the early intervention program? And what are their next steps? Um, I am going to um, tell everybody who's in the breakout sessions, if I can find my right screen on here. Um, so Tiffany, your group is going to take um, question number one, what strategies, interventions, resources, and tools can be used to reduce challenging behavior at home? Um, Wendy, your group is going to be taking how do we reduce challenging behaviors at school? And then Kurt, your group is going to be taking what services are available for the child and family as they transition out of the early intervention program. Jeanette, so, yes. Did you, have, did you have Natalie on one of those? Or you? I'm, we moved her. Okay. All right. I was going to say, I think she left. Thanks. So it was Tiffany and um, you and then Wendy. So Shana, you can go ahead and put us in breakout groups. Your group. Um, I think the the one of the biggest ideas, once again, we brought it up. With the with the last one was using the skills taught by TBRI, um, just focusing on what the behavior is, not focusing on um, or what's behind the behavior. Sorry, not focusing on what the behavior is, and and using YouTube to find. I mean, there's a lot of information about TBRI and YouTube, and just using that information to um, really help understand what you can do for your child. So hmm, that's awesome. Great. Well, thank you all for joining. We will compile those. So please send all your notes and everything to our project scope at usu.edu. Um, and we will save those over onto our Canvas page. Our next session is going to be in May. Um, I don't have a calendar right here with me, so I have to look really fast. So May 8th is when our next session will be. Um, hope to see you guys there. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your e afternoon. I guess it's not evening. Afternoon. I'm ready for bed already. <laughs>